There we are. Oh, camera, please do not swear. Um, right, so we've um, we've seen some some trends in group two already. Where are magnesium calcium strength? Barium. Let's just remind ourselves about some trends as we go down group two. I'll let you have a think about that. Rather than dropping on someone, it's still quite early in the morning. Trends down group two. Trends down any group, really. As you go, you go across the periodic table, we have one set of trends, don't we? As we go down a group, any group, down the periodic table, we get another set of trends. Reducing strength increases. Reducing strength increases. Okay, so um, that was that was a bit out there. Yeah, um, I have to, I'm having to think about this now. Is that right? Reducing strength increases. So they um, barium loses electrons more readily than magnesium. Yes, that is right. Okay, good man. I was I was uh, waiting for one of the big three, but that's great. You know, that's, that's great. Knock it out of the park on the first ball. Um, somebody else. Electronegativity. That's what I was expecting. Electronegativity. What was the trend? Decreases. Yeah, always decreases down any group in the periodic table. That's great. Someone else. Atomic radius increases. Lovely. And then there's one more in our, our kind of toolkit. Ionization energy decreases. Okay. Of course, they're all linked. What's the underlying cause linking all of these? Okay, so as we're going down the group, we're getting more shells. Each successive line on the periodic table is another electron shell. So more shells, more shielding. Less force of attraction on the outside electron. Fantastic. Uh, less force or weaker force of attraction between the, the nucleus and the outer electrons, whatever it is we're trying to attract. So electronegativity, it would be about the force between the nucleus and covalent bonds or covalently bonded electrons generally these atoms they're metals so they don't covalently bond but you, you can actually you can persuade magnesium to covalently bond so it's not it's not unmeasurable uh, atomic radius increases well that should be fairly straightforward as are we adding more shells they get further and further from the nucleus and Ionization energy decreases because again there's a weaker force of attraction between the nucleus and those outermost electrons, so it takes less energy to remove them. And of course, that's related to their reducing strength because reducing agents are able to give away or donate electrons, and so barium takes less energy to remove those electrons than magnesium. Uh, I needed to think about it for a moment, but yes, you're absolutely right. So, uh, barium would make a much better reducing agent. All the metals are pretty good reducing agents. Um, they're, they're all good at giving away electrons. In fact, that's our definition of metal. If if you want to find out if a, if an atom is a metal or a non-metal, then just ask yourself the question: Well, does it does it prefer to lose electrons or gain electrons? If it loses electrons, we class it as a metal. Okay, that's that's great. Um, so all of that is is summarised in the in the book there. Um, <coughs> okay, I th I think we covered the reactions with water. Um, before, but let's just remind ourselves. If we chuck, um, well, magnesium and cold water doesn't, doesn't really go, but let's, so let's go for calcium. Stick a bit of calcium in some water. What do we get there? Not, 
so much today. Have a little water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Give us a name first before we get to the formula. Um, calcium oxide. It's um, not calcium oxide. So if it's cold water, hydroxide. And then because hydroxide ions are minus one, calcium causing group two is plus two, we need two hydroxides for every calcium. And the other product is. Okay, if we use uh, steam, and we'll, we'll demonstrate this tomorrow, um, it is quite good fun. So there's no, there's no kind of liquid water around, we're just reacting the magnesium with, with, with heated steam. Then we get, then we get, then we get the oxide, that's right. So. Magnesium literally rips the water molecule into, into bits. Okay, um, but both produce hydrogen gas. So just, just be aware of that. So that, that's cold, obviously, or you know, room temperature, and this is um, hot or high temperature. Has steam, so it has to be over 100 degrees, right? So, um, yeah. Um, Did we, did we do the reaction with uh, the extraction of titanium? Did we do that? We wrote it down. You wrote it down. It's, it's a couple of very boring equations. I'm not going to bother to write them down again. They're in the topic booklet if you've forgotten them. The, the nature of inorganic reactions is, is there's lots of them. Okay, let's get on to the, the important stuff that I really want to talk about today then, which is the idea of solubility. So let's just, um, just think about that word solubility. What, what, is, what does that mean? Dissolving in water. Dissolving in water, yeah. But the, the word solubility, if I talk about the solubility of something, what am I talking about? Isn't it the electronegativity of it? So it has to be more electronegative. No, I, I don't want to get into the exact reasons for why for, for why some things are soluble or not soluble. I just want to get into that word. Solubility means what? If I talk about the solubility of calcium hydroxide. Ability to dissolve. It's ability to dissolve. Okay, that's that's good. Can we improve on that? Chemists, scientists like like numbers, don't they? It's not, not about energy. How could you quantify solubility? It would be the volume. Volume of what? Well, like when you dissolve something. Oh, I'm thinking of uh, when it's like saturated and it won't dissolve anymore. Okay, well, so we have that word saturated, which means the amount that we can dissolve before it kind of stops dissolving. So if you add salt to water, a bit will dissolve and then a bit will dissolve, but if you keep on going, eventually you'll end up with a pile of salt at the bottom of your, your beaker of water. So where, where's the solubility in that in that experiment? I'm adding salt to water, keep on going until I can't dissolve anymore. What's the solubility? The amount of salt you put in. Like right. Well, we don't call it an excess. That uh, that word is used for reactions. And is dissolving a chemical reaction? Well, we can have that discussion another time. But um, you're right. It's the amount we can dissolve. Okay. So we when we introduce when we talk about solubility 
well, we don't talk about solubility in GCSE. We talk about some things dissolve and some things don't. Yeah, sugar dissolves in water, flour doesn't, sand doesn't. And we tend to have a sort of cut and dry yes and no, but actually that's not really a, the true picture. The true picture is that everything will dissolve in water to a certain degree. It's just a question of how much. So solubility is the amount of stuff that will dissolve in a certain amount of water. Now, we, we don't actually have to go into solubility. There's a page on it in the topic booklet if you're interested, but it's, it's off syllabus now. But what I'm just trying to get across today is that solubility is about how much stuff will dissolve. And sometimes you can get things that we would normally say are insoluble, but actually they're not insoluble. They're just a very small amount will dissolve. So solubility, to, to be really precise, it's the mass that dissolves in 100 centimetres cubed of water. That's the, that's the definition. So when we talk about the solubility of something, we're saying how much would dissolve in 100 cc's of water? Okay, and I, I can give you some, give you some numbers there on um, <coughs> page nine of the, of the topic booklet there. So, for example, magnesium sulfate, uh, 35.1 grams will dissolve in 100 cm cubed of water. Well, we'd say that was fairly, that's fairly soluble, isn't it? If you put magnesium sulfate into water and stirred it, it would dissolve. Right, if I look at barium sulfate, down the other end of the group, it's 2.45 times 10 to the minus 4 grams. That's a much smaller number. You're probably not even going to notice 2.45 times 10 to the minus 4 grams. We're talking less than a thousandth of a gram. That's less than would be measured from one of our balances. You know, you think about when you're measuring something out with the balances, how, how small amount 0.01 of a gram is. It's kind of like a like a few grains, and we're talking like a hundredth of that. So practically none will dissolve. So then we get into this, you know, well, is barium sulfate insoluble? Well, well, we would say it's insoluble, yes. Because if you put it into water, you're not going to notice anything dissolving. A tiny amount is dissolving, but you're not going to see it. Okay, so we would refer to magnesium sulfate as soluble, and barium sulfate as insoluble, but really it's just a question of degree. Is, is this making sense? So, um, if I strung out all the sulfates, and remember we, we ignore ba uh, beryllium, then we'd see a decrease in solubility going down the group. So, for all practical purposes, magnesium sulfate is soluble, barium sulfate is insoluble, but it's a question of degree. And, and again, if you look at the data on... Uh, on page nine, for calcium sulfate, it's 0.25 of a gram, a quarter of a gram. That's not very much. That's like a little bit on a spatula. For strontium sulfate, 0.0132, less, no, just over a hundredth of a gram. So we can see a trend there. They're getting less and less soluble. Now, uh, important to recognize you're not going to be asked to explain why. You do not need to explain that. You just need to know it as a fact that barium sulfate is insoluble and magnesium sulfate is soluble and we have a trend going down. You're not going to be asked to explain it. We do go into solubility in more depth next year and we'll talk about why some things dissolve and why they don't. But for the moment, don't worry about it. Okay. Um... Okay, so let's imagine that we've got, I've got
put a beaker of, of water here uh, and I've got another beaker with some some barium ions in it don't worry about what they're with and another beaker with some sulfate ions and they're both dissolved we've got completely dissolved sulfate and completely dissolved barium and I'll take a few drops uh, that was supposed to be a dropper no. okay my droppers aren't very good today um, take a few drops of that and stick it in there and a few drops of that and stick it in there what happens next take some dissolved barium and some dissolved sulfate and mix them together in, in a beaker of water what happens we get we, we do it's exactly right we get solid barium sulfate we can't sort of sneak up on barium sulfate and say okay well, I've got dissolved barium and dissolved sulfate so maybe if I put them together the water won't notice it, it won't work the water will notice and it'll say oh you've got barium and sulfate in the same place they don't dissolve so they stop dissolving. What, what does that actually look like? It'd be this way across. Yeah. It'd be similar to the display across. It, it would be, yes. It'd be similar to some other test tube tests we've done as well, but maybe we'll come back to those in a moment. It'd be a precipitate. It would be a precipitate, that's right. Okay, so... We can use this as a test. And it's our test for, bear, uh, for sulfate ions. Um, I'm just going to put this as number two, not to be too obscure. Um, so, if we're testing for sulfate, we add we need to add a dissolved form of barium. So barium chloride dissolves fairly well. So we could add a little barium chloride solution. Um, and yeah, we get a white precipitate or a PPT. I Means sulfate is present. We've seen this kind of test before, haven't we? I think we've seen this test before. Chloride ions. Yeah, for chloride. Now, for chloride, we tested with what? Chloride bromide iodide? What do we test with? Silver nitrate. Silver nitrate, okay. Um, and, and it did a similar thing because silver chloride is insoluble, and same for silver bromide and silver iodide. Um, when we did the silver test, we had to add something at the start. Acid. Yeah, do you remember why? Remove carb carbonate ions. Right, so we do something similar here. So, um, we could add nitric acid, that, that would always work. Or we could also add hydrochloric acid. As long as we don't add sulfuric acid, because if we add sulfuric acid, we've already thrown some sulfate ions into the mix. So that would stuff up our test. We get a false positive. What would be a good um, what would be a good test for barium ions? Right, we add some sulfate. So remember this, tests can go in both directions, okay? If, if barium is the test for sulfate, then sulfate would be the test for barium. So we could add, I don't know, sodium sulfate solution, say. So... Pretty much every chemical test you ever do in chemistry works both ways. Yeah, so Benedict's test is a test for aldehydes, so we could use aldehydes as a test for Benedict's. You know, it'd be a bit of an odd situation 
but all tests work in both directions. Um, okay, so so tr try not to forget that. Let's just um, let's just remind ourselves about the tests for. Um, Oh no, we just need to do an um, ionic equation for fairly straightforward for this. Remember, an ionic equation just shows the ions taking part in the, in the reaction. So barium ions react with sulfate ions to make barium sulfate. For either of those two tests, it's going to be the same, the same ionic equation. Um, yeah, so we we did a test for chloride, bromide, and iodide with um, nitric acid first, and then. Silver nitrate solution. What were the, the three possibilities? <clears throat> Isn't it not a mirror? It's not, not a mirror. <laughs> yeah, I just mentioned the aldehyde test, didn't I? With, uh, well, Benedict's is the one that gives a brick red precipitate, but s silver, um, silver nitrate or a, a solution of silver nitrate and some other stuff with aldehydes gives you a silver mirror. That's nice. That's good. You, you need that. You need that as well. Uh, but in the organic questions on the paper, not the not the inorganic, which is what this is. Um, so we're testing for chloride, bromide, or iodide. What what? So I have three possibilities. Chloride would be white. So chloride is a white precipitate. Bromine would be green. Bromide. Bromide. And iodide would be yellow. And then sometimes if we get a sort of greyish, off-white colour, we might do another test on those three precipitates. Someone, someone else thinks. Oh, do you add ammonia? We do. Do we add dilute or concentrated ammonia? Well, both is the answer, but usually dilute first. So, can you remember the? Can you remember the order of play? So, the uh, white is precipitated first. In. Dilute. Okay, so rather than saying disappears, we'd say dissolves, dissolves in dilute ammonia. Bromide. Dissolves in dilute ammonia. No. Yeah, that's it. It's got to be a difference, right? Because what we're doing is trying to tell these three apart. And no change. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so that's... I'm, I'm reminding you of this for a reason, because we're coming up to the... Um, the next required prac, um, uh, which is... Um, it'll be next week. But... Um, the required prac is going to be about testing, just testing ions, and it's going to include this stuff as well, chloride, bromide, and iodide, as well as the, the new stuff that we're doing here on sulfate and um, hydroxide, which I'll do in a moment now. But yeah, that's on, <laughs> if, if you look at page, um, page 16 of the topic booklet, you'll see it's a fairly, it's a, just four substances, and you test them with a bunch of different things. Okay. So uh, we're, we're not going to give you any help with that. In fact, for the required prac, what we're testing is your ability to add stuff to other stuff and record correct observations. Um, well, obviously, we'll ask you about what, what they might be, but for the actual prac, what we're really focused on is is your ability to just do practicals carefully and precisely and 
and record correct observations. Okay, um, let's let's move on. Let's go back to group two and. Uh, I said solubility, didn't I? So let's do that again. Solubility. Hydroxides. Okay. And unfortunately, it's the other way around. So you can see that AQA are going to have fun with that. So, again, the data is on page nine of the topic booklet. But as we go down the group for the hydroxide, solubility increases. So it's the exact opposite of the trend. So the least soluble hydroxide is magnesium hydroxide and the most soluble hydroxide is barium hydroxide. How could I use this in testing, do you think? What could I use to test for for what? Thinking about the tests that we just did using the solubility of sulfates. You can use the magnesium oil to find the hydroxide. I could use magnesium, the solution of magnesium. Maybe magnesium sulfate would work well, we know that dissolves. So I could use magnesium sulfate solution to test for hydroxide. And you could use hydroxide to test for magnesium. And I can use hydroxide, say sodium hydroxide is a good solution, to test for magnesium. So we can use that solubility to, to work for us in the tests as well. Um, magnesium and barium are kind of the opposites, and we've, we've really focused on those so far. So um, if I stuck some hydroxide in with some magnesium ions, I'd probably get a precipitate. But what about calcium? Well, it's a trend, remember. So if magnesium hydroxide is insoluble, calcium hydroxide... So we often use this, this word sparingly, which means a tiny amount dissolves, but not very much. So I can get a, I can get a bit of calcium hydroxide dissolved. If I add, you know, spatula load after spatula load, it'll very quickly become saturated, but a bit will dissolve. That, that means it's going to be tricky. Say I'm testing for, for magnesium ions. I've got some sodium hydroxide. I add that and I get a, I get a precipitate. Well, it probably is magnesium, but it depends. Depends on the, the concentrations of the hydroxide and the calcium ions. If they're pretty concentrated, I might get a white precipitate for calcium. I might not. So there's going to be a little bit of uncertainty there. If I get, you know, bang to right, immediately white precipitate, great, magnesium. But if I just get a sort of tiny bit of precipitate in the background, like I can hardly see it, it's a white precipitate, but it's, it's, it's very, very faint, well then, you know, maybe it's calcium, it, it's it's going to be hard to make that distinction. And the same for uh, strontium. Strontium sulfate is sparingly soluble as well. So again, if I get an immediate <coughs> white precipitate, bash, easy, barium. But if it's, yeah, it's difficult to say, is there a precipitate there? You know, when you hold it up to the light, sure that's a precipitate. Maybe there's some strontium going on. So a little bit of judgment is required here. Uh, the good news is, as far as AQA is concerned, 
If you say a white precipitate is calcium, they'll probably give you the mark because it might be. Um, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Um, just two little, little random facts. Um, I didn't mention barium sulfate uh, has a use. It's it's very insoluble, and that gives it a use. Uh, it's called the barium meal, which does not sound like an appetizing kind of feast. Um, they, they give it to you in hospital. So you, you drink a, a suspension, which is water just mixed up with lots of barium sulfate solid. Uh, you drink it um, and then the barium travels through your intestines. Any idea why they would do this to you in a hospital? Or x-rays. Yeah, that's right. So barium's a heavy metal, and like all heavy metals, it shows up in an x-ray. You can't x-ray someone's intestines, though, because your intestines are made of soft stuff. You know, x-rays show up bone and cartilage, but they don't show up intestines. So you drink your barium meal, and then as that finds its way through your intestines, your x-ray, your, your stomach and your intestines, and then they can, they can use the barium to show up any inflammation or abnormalities in your intestines. Now, barium's toxic, right? But barium sulfate's safe because... Dilute. No, it's not because it's dilute. It's <laughs> if it was dilute, you'd still have a problem. Because it's, it's insoluble. Your intestines can only absorb dissolved minerals. So you, know, you, can't, you can't absorb the barium sulfate into your system, so it's safe unpleasant I'd imagine especially when it reaches the other end I really wouldn't want to be there for that but um but safe and and, and it allows those those medical procedures to, to take place um one more random fact um, um calcium oxide um or or calcium carbonate are used to remove sulfur dioxide from flue gases after burning fossil fuels. Why don't we like sulfur dioxide? Acid rain. Acid rain, thank you very much. Yeah, so sulfur dioxide goes out into the atmosphere, dissolves in rainwater, causes acid rain, kills crops, trees, fish, etc. So we don't like that. So they pass the, the gases through uh, either a uh, a, a suspension of calcium oxide or calcium carbonate and um, the sulfur dioxide reacts with that. No sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, no acid rain. Okay. That's it.